need some research. It smokes, it drinks, it philosophizes. Just let me suck, please. Just let me suck on each one. <laughs> My mouth bleeding, Bart! Shall we talk now or wait? Welcome back to another episode of Hard Out with myself, Jay Thornton, and R. Michael Gall. Today we got two guests, Christopher Rusinski, who's a filmmaker and the lead of his latest feature, Jesse Gavin. The movie is called Northern Shade, right? That's it. How are you doing, fellas? Pretty good. Doing good, yeah. Great. Thanks for having us. I just watched it this morning. It's fucking good. Really good. Thank you. Should be Thanks. proud of it. Super intense. My gosh. And it your is. performance, dude. Dude. Oh. I was so happy. Uh, Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I'm so happy you showed up with the mustache. I was hoping you would have that <laughs> walrus stash intact. It's a, it's, it's a fake one. I had, to, I had to put it back on. <laughs> I need to get one. I'm so jealous. I got that Keanu Reeves DNA, the patches and shit, you know? <laughs> I think came in full. Do you want to yeah, tell folks sure. what the film is about? Sure. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so Northern Shades about a uh, uh, army veteran, um, OEF veteran who who uh, is kind of living a reclusive life on his boat in Connecticut, and he uh, he finds out his younger brother got involved in something. Or actually, at first, his younger brother's missing, and then as he gets into it and unravels the mystery of where he is, he realizes he's, he's kind of in a, an extremist group. So, um, yeah, it's about his, his journey to try to regain his brother's trust because they've been estranged for several years, um, and pull him out of this thing before his brother goes through with whatever the plot is that they're, uh, they're planning. Yeah, it treads some similar ground to our own Cactus Jack, which I don't know when this will be released, but this is being recorded on the 3rd, and our film is supposed to come out tomorrow. Nice. They're supposed to, because they still don't have the pre-order up on Voodoo or anything, which is making me nervous, sort of, but I actually kind of don't mind if we go that whole too hot for TV thing and have to just sell physical media out of our trunk, you know, it could be a good marketing (laughs) hook, but uh, (laughs) probably that MC Hammer energy. (laughs) <laughs> but you guys aren't nearly as off the wall like the bad guy in your film billy i was just describing you off camera our guy's basically him on bath salts yeah yours is a movie i would recommend to anybody <laughs> like ours it's like yeah, a certain type of person might enjoy this movie you know most people will be yeah. offended by it etc yours isn't right. offensive you know yours is just solid it's good really well made i mean good he, Lord. Um, what's that sorry really well made my god it, it's gorgeous oh thank you the, the sound is perfect it's just it's really well done it's yeah, just it does not really feel well like an independent together. like what kind of budget were you guys working with pretty low production budget i mean we definitely put uh <laughs> we we it was a tall order of the cast and crew um based on the budget we had so it was, it was all in all, it's, it's the entire budget with posts and, you know, marketing and, and deliverables and all that is probably going to be under 150. Nice. Um, but production was like half that. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but it, it looks good because, I mean, we had some solid locations in Connecticut, you know, we shot during the fall and it's hard to beat that New England like fall look. For sure. Um, but our DP, um, Greg, Greg Gill, has been a longtime friend of both of ours. And um, I grew up with him in Connecticut. So we both knew the areas we wanted to film at. And uh, we didn't do, have to do much scouting because we grew up around those locations. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> like the the Corey location, we we used to have ragers back there and just bonfires used to burn like, trucks for fun that was some old footage from high school yeah, used. yeah that was actually footage from high school yeah. <laughs> how fun was that torching a truck that was fun yeah yeah, yeah Did you guys that was make cool. s'mores or anything <laughs> no well you know it's funny we were told by the um the uh, fire department that like peak burn would only last a few minutes you know so we had to like yeah really take a documentary approach where it was like, all right, this is it. This is one shot we have to get these shots. Um, 
but Greg's background is documentary. So he just, you know, he had his, we, we shot it with a red and he had it on a gimbal and he just kept it rolling for the entire time of yeah, the truck burn. For sure. And the truck actually burned for like 30 minutes and it looked like really good. So we, we just never cut. So we had like a 40 minute take. <laughs> so yeah, all those shots in the beginning of the movie, those were one take and we right. just ran around picking off, you know, the slow pullback, the, mm -hmm. the close up of the truck, the shots of Matthew and Charlie looking at the truck. Like that was just great no running cuts. around with, with one take never cutting. Cause that's one of the beauties of digital too. I feel we did that a lot with digital. It's like, just keep it running. Fuck it. Keep it running. Yeah. You know, You're going to piss off right. your editor, but. Right. If well, you're editing case, the movie. Then... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Gavin. Yeah. How far back do you guys go? Cause I noticed on IMDb, you had worked together on some short films and shit in the past. You guys have known each other for years or what? We, uh, we actually, um, when I moved out to LA, um, before I made the move, I just went on Craigslist and just look for a cheap place to live. So uh, there's a guy that was, um, had a house and he's kind of running like a hostel. So you have, you know, bunk beds and a lot of people are just moving to LA or, or maybe just there for like the summer. It was right by, um, there's like dance studios in North Hollywood. So there's a lot of people from like Europe that were there for the summer. So I just looked that up and I got put in a, in a room. And um, after my first roommate moved out a couple months in, Chris moved in. So he was like, maybe one of the first people I met in LA. We got put, our first creative decision was, I walked in the room uh, and the guy was gone and there was like a new bag there and the beds were moved side by side. <laughs> <laughs> like and pushed so, together? Yeah, pushed together. <laughs> like it, it became like a queen. And it was just, you know, I was, cl I was clocking a lot of information. You know, I got like, there's the bag, there's there's like a bass. And I was like, oh, musician, that's cool. I'm and picturing then, the planes, um, trains, and automobiles shot. Zoom, zoom. Oh, shit. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah. So then, uh, and then finally, I think it was like a couple hours later, he came home and Started, started talking and you know i'm from uh, upstate new york because from connecticut i feel like they're you know they're kind of similar areas and um yeah just got to talking i think we we talked about going to a hockey game and then uh, after we had maybe a 20 minute chat i kind of brought up i said hey so um i don't know what's going on with the beds being side by side but <laughs> do you want to like move it so that was like our, our first creative collaboration was uh to not spoon. agreeing agreeing <laughs> to move the beds Back to where they were. I don't know why they got moved together. Who like hearing that we're not going to sleep next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> Chris is like, and we, can shot. we get to the bottom of why you put them together in the first place? Yeah. Right. <laughs> that was the, the guy. The guy put the beds together. The guy it's running the house. Uh, yeah. uh -oh. The guy knew, the, he knew, the, guy we the secret gonna... camera is the one who put them together. Exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't uh, do a sweep for hidden cameras. That's what we should have done. <laughs> so did you use a casting agent when you went to make this movie or you just already had all these actors like Gavin rounded up or no, Jesse? So Jesse, Jesse was the only one where, um, like I knew from the beginning. I, I mean, also when I sent the script to Je I sent the script to Jesse and I sent it to Greg. Um, cause I had been workshopping it a little bit with my buddy, Kyle, who is an OEF army veteran. And once it was kind of in a good spot, I sent it to Greg and Jesse. And um, if if neither of them wanted to do it or thought we could do it for the for the budget, um, I was probably not going to make the movie. But yeah. Jesse definitely had reservations, which he can tell you about. But I if if it was a hard no from Jesse or Greg, I wasn't going to make the movie. Um, but you know, Jesse was was always in mind for the lead. And then Joe, who plays his younger brother, um, Joseph Poliquin, um, Jesse and I had worked with him on a short film called Sven. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have any lines in that movie. And he just played a kid who gets, uh, spoiler, killed. Um, but he was so good and emotive that, um, and there's just a, a kind of a kindred spirit and resemblance like between Joe and Jesse. So I, I just had him in mind for the brother and, but I didn't know if he was going to be able to do it because he's a pretty busy guy, but um, yeah, he was thrilled. He read the script and got back to me like same day. <laughs> um, so, so we had those two and then I casted for most everyone else. I actually, no, sorry, Alejandro. I, I always had in mind for Noel. 
His, he's his great in it too. Album. He's so good. Like he's got kind of like an Oscar Isaac and Drive kind of vibe to him. I thought like I could see him yeah. carrying oh, nice. a film. You know what I mean? Just that he has a presence. Yeah, yeah. And we really we we also tried to. He has a natural presence for sure, and we also tried to highlight that and um, give him a, a little more of a ethereal presence too. We backlit him a mm-hmm. lot, tried to give him a little halo lighting, you know, um, yep. just anything subtle we could do to to make him, um, you know, spoiler, a ghost. Um, so he's the Val Kilmer Elvis to Jesse's <laughs> Clarence Worley. <laughs> yeah Alejandro, it was it was kind of like the three of those those guys like i those were the core like if if any one of those guys couldn't do it or if they fell through i, I don't know how we would have made the movie right on. Um, and then everyone else um i either knew um and had in mind to cast or we found on backstage nice. yeah. including yeah. billy who does a great job so Billy came, name? yeah, Billy's um, played by Romano or Zari, and he does a really good job. And he came recommended from uh, uh, a buddy of mine who I met actually on the film festival circuit for Sven, um, this guy, Christopher Martini, who is a producer and director in New York. And um, uh, he and I met in Montana at a film festival, and, and we had, like, similar um, – taste in movies and and we kind of kept in touch and he was going to produce the movie but he had just had a, a baby boy so he was a little occupied um but he he told me he had someone in mind for billy and and romano sent in an audition and um it, that was the hardest part to cast i mean as as you guys probably know it's like you know when when you have like a villain that espouses like some hard to swallow stuff, um, you want to make sure someone can do it without, um, going to, uh, villain, you know, you want to be on board with them for a certain, up to a certain extent. (laughs) So you don't want, you don't want them to be villain like right off the top. Um, and Billy has that really, uh, Romano rather has that that kind of cunning touch to everything he does. So Definitely. he he was giving me some serious Stacy Keach in American History X vibes. Yeah, like those guys could have gone bowling together. <laughs> oh man, that wouldn't quite the game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I I I had a couple <clears throat> references um, for for the dynamics. Um, I'd say for Matthew, who plays the kind of the security patrol for the militia, the big guy who gets mm-hmm. um, shot, um, that dynamic between Matthew and Billy, I was going for kind of a, um, grapes of wrath kind of thing. Um, yeah. um, Matthew's the Lenny, obviously. Yes. Yeah. And then for the the dynamic, like you said, American History X, that that kind of like trying to get your younger brother out of something that you might have subscribed to at one time, or or you don't subscribe to at all, but you're you have some kind of a strange relationship with someone and trying to pull them out of it. But there's this other figure who's definitely more front and center in this person's life, and you're trying to figure out how to actually pull them out from under the influence. Mm-hmm. When I think too, there is a parallel. It's like what Jesse found that brotherhood he found in the military. His brother was looking for. He found it in this movement, which yeah. is in our research. A lot of what this shit comes down to is obviously loners, isolated people looking for a tribe. Yes, they find it in these groups. You know. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that word tribe because that I I don't know if you've read that book by Sebastian Junger. Yeah, I did read that. Yeah, yeah. Good that book, book really opened my eyes to some things and um i took that research and i actually gave that book to to my buddy kyle um 
And so we talked about that book a lot and we, we tried to incorporate some of those themes. Mm -hmm. in the like in the military, no one falls through the cracks. Charlie obviously is falling through the cracks, you know, and that's where he yeah. lands. But in the military, I've been in the military. There's no falling through the cracks. There's so much accountability involved at all times that right. you always feel like a vital cog in the machine, which is what really that book is about. You know, people feeling purposeless yeah. because they, once you get your tribe gets too big, essentially it was this thesis, right? Then once it reaches in, it's not a big number. It's like 150 people or something. Once you go beyond that, people start slipping through the cracks. Mm. You know? Right. Yeah. I think, yeah, that was pretty fascinating. 150 people is like the golden. It's just not much. No. At all. <laughs> Jonestown might have had more. <laughs> right. So what were your reservations, Jesse, with doing this film? Was it just fiscally because he couldn't pay you your quote or what, what was it? <laughs> Uh, 100%, I think, um, uh, I've never like in all the years of acting, I've never, uh, uh, played someone that was in the military. So I had, you know, I had it would be like a brand new exploration for me. Um, a lot of times it's like, you know, you, people offer you roles. Well, the greatest thing about working with Chris is I feel like he always gives me roles that have just are brand new for me. Um, and I really, which is awesome because I really have to like do the work and, and do something new. Um, I think it, the best way I can, I, I just liken it to like when I watch hockey movies. They grew up playing hockey. And when you're kind of in a world and you watch a hockey movie and you see someone playing a hockey player that's so clearly not a hockey player, it really it bothers me a lot. And that's hockey. That's like, that's like much lower stakes. And so I think I just, um, I just didn't want to be the equivalent of that to someone else. Um, and, and because it's going to be brand new for me, I think I had like a solid two months um, that I got a script before we started filming. So it was a good amount of time. But I think just reading it combined with it's, you know, it's a huge role. It's a roller coaster ride. So there's there's so much amazing stuff to get ready for. I, I just wanted to make sure that that I didn't do like a disrespectful portrayal of someone that was uh, of a veteran. Uh, yeah. So that, that was really my reservation was I just didn't want to be that guy that is just, you know, doing the I don't want to call it the Hollywood version of a veteran. But like, you know, to just yeah, to just kind of be a jerk about it. <laughs> So. Did you feel more like the tactical type stuff would be an issue or do you just mean the way a soldier carries themselves or what? Because I'll say real quickly as a veteran, again, completely bought you because that's what Thank you. the military is. It's just this huge melting pot of people from all walks of life. And in the movies, they tend to make them all these lantern jawed GI types, like, right. you know, even great movies like Hacksaw Ridge or something. They all just kind of have that GI look to them, but having served, yeah. that's not the case. Those guys are few and far between, you know? So it was super that, refreshing the way you cast this movie. Everybody looks like real people, which to me is fucking huge. It's, mm -hmm. you know, like movies like Bubble, where Soderbergh would just go to a town and cast out of the town. Yeah. I eat that shit up. You know, I hate that yeah. central casting look when you see the the six doctors standing there like the Avengers or whatever with the <laughs> wind machine on. I hate that shit. So props. 100%. I think uh, one of the cool things about that was uh, I got to kind of get Kyle Berg, who was, um, the military tech advisor for the film, which uh, Chris mentioned earlier, I got his phone number pretty early on and was just calling him and just asking, uh, cause there was the tactical issue. Like I wanted to make sure that that looked good. So I got to, uh, I had five days working with Kyle before we started filming. Um, but it was just like the two months of just hopping on the phone with him and just asking him all sorts of weird questions and like just all the different characters that he, uh, that he knew people that he knew the different types of people. And I, I, I would basically just ask him about everyone he knew and all the stories and in my brain was just kind of crafting together who like a real person would be that's a, that's a veteran as opposed to i would say if you if we if i if i had one week to prepare i would have shown up just like a i'm a military guy and i would just been like a robot military guy um yeah yeah so getting to talk to kyle all that time i felt like i got to create uh, based off of stories he told me i kind of just took them all and just crafted what i thought was like a real person so yeah cool. yeah he had some really i mean you guys talked for a while and 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 you got to really go into some nuanced stuff. And I was glad that that happened because it was, it, it, like you said, it was, it's not just the tactical stuff. It's just like all the, all the things that make up that person and that experience. And um, yeah, it was good that you two got to talk. And like, I, I remember that the moment of the, um, you told me about the story of the sunglasses where it was like, <laughs> If you're like thrust, if you're sleeping and you, you're woken up extremely fast and you have to scramble, what's the first thing you, you reach for? And and Kyle was Kyle said his sunglasses. 
Yeah, I told him, you know, I, I think Adam Sandler has a song about uh, wallet phone keys, which is like when you when you when I leave the apartment, I, I just, it's like I just do that. I just I don't even think about doing it. I just kind of do it. So I, I asked Kyle, I was like, if you yeah, if you kind of woke up and you didn't know where you were, what would be the first thing you would do? And he was like, without your son, losing your sunglasses, such a big deal. So I don't think that it wasn't even necessarily that I don't even know if I did it. I think there was maybe a take or two where I did it, but it was just more so like feeling that in my body. And like, what are those like little things that someone does when they have that history? What's kind of like built, built into their, their muscle memory. Devils yeah. in the details. It's awesome. Yeah. What kind of uh, Jesse, what kind of acting training have you got? Are you formally trained or? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, well, I, so I went to, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I did a theater degree. Um, so uh, they didn't have like a proper BFA acting program or anything, but, you know, I got to do plays and taking acting classes. And then when I moved to New York City, I studied Meisner uh, at uh, the William Esper studio. So I, I studied with a guy named Terry Knickerbocker, who uh, the reason I studied with him is because he uh, would coach Sam Rockwell on this movie. And I'm just Sam a huge Sam Rockwell man. fan. Fuck yeah. <sighs> Love it. Like I saw I remember when I saw Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, I was oh. like it was my senior year of college and I had like gone down to New York City the summer before and I like I like, you know. I just, I thought I was like, oh, I'm going to finish my senior year and I'm just going to hit it hard. And I felt so confident and I saw Confessions of a Dangerous Mind and I had just like a crisis. I had a, I was like, just because it was like one of those things where like, I'm pretty sure I yeah. can't do that. And it was like <laughs> to see an actor be that good. Um, so yeah, so when I was in New York, I heard that his coach taught at Esper Studios. So I just, yeah, I made it happen. <laughs> Perfect. It's such Perfect. a thin line between being inspired and just completely intimidated when you see somebody crush shit like that. <laughs> yeah, they, I would say intimidated. I, it, yeah, it, yeah it, it haunted me. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, it 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 worked. It paid off. Yeah, right. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you were you were incredible in this. It was, and that's my. For me, I mean, I'm not a filmmaker. I'm just a dumb actor. Um, so I watch, I watch films from that perspective. I look at the performances. You could be, you could be reading Ikea instructions and I'm just looking at the, at the performances of it and nothing didn't ring like none of usually in a, in a, in a smaller film, in an indie film, in a lower budget film, especially when you're casting people, you know, or guys that someone, you know, knows usually people will keep someone in the movie who eh, <laughs> you don't really have the heart to, to say, yeah. you know, you don't really say, can I have your license and registration convincingly? We're going to have to read, you know, so they'll keep, they'll keep the, some of those smaller roles and, and they don't ring true. Everything in this thing is, is just naturalistic and exactly. all the performances are, it's really fucking well done <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> from that, that from that perspective yeah. as well. I, it just, just yeah. the performances and, and I mean, Billy pontificates and he does bad guy speeches yeah. and things, which people don't typically do in life as much, but even those like, he's a pedagogue though. Pedagogues yeah. do that shit. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was so, so well performed the whole thing front to back. Amazing. Yeah, which is a testament, of course, to the director. But uh, that's why I asked, too, if you had a casting agent, because like you said, every little role, no one feels yeah. as if they're acting, which is usually the major thing. Yeah. Across in these yeah. Budget, this budget point, you know, even with the backstage, I mean, we found Titania, who plays Frankie through backstage. And she I mean, she had a tall order because we had to shoot. <laughs> and I sprung this on her like only two days before, but we had to shoot her big monologue on the back of the boat where she's, she's telling the story of why she's not a cop anymore. Um, we had to shoot that on day one and, and we hadn't even met in person <laughs> yet. <laughs> I actually hadn't met a lot of the actors in person because this was, we did yeah, all crazy. production during COVID. So I didn't have the luxury of, of doing any in-person auditions or callbacks. Like everything was cast um, aside from Jesse and Alejandro and people I knew, everything was cast like through Zoom. Um, so yeah, I mean, she came, she came prepared day one and did the monologue. And thank God because I mean, we the day one day one was a nightmare because of <laughs> we had to get the boat from one marina to another, 
which was up a river. And normally, normally it should take about 35, 40 minutes. Um, it took like three and a half hours because um, the boat kept stalling. And then we're down to one engine and that one engine kept stalling. And then we're like, are we actually going to be able to get the boat up river? Yeah. It was, it was a, it was a real uh, heart of darkness. <laughs> it's like, are we ever going to get up this river? Um, but uh, we finally got to the place where we had to shoot that monologue and, and she nailed it. Um, and same with uh, Joel Cena, who plays Austin, the guy with the eye patch. Yeah. yeah. He was, uh, I cast him off backstage. Like he just, he nailed the audition. Like a lot of people submitted for that role. I don't know what it was about that role, but I think we had the most submissions on Having backstage. an eye patch in my reel would be awesome. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> yeah. And then you kind of get to see what people think is an eye patch. <laughs> <laughs> there were, there were quite a few, head. like, you know, every range from, oh man, it, it, it ranged like just from a, a bed sheet to like, to whatever, to finding the, just anything to put in their eye. Gauze, and, scotch taped around their head. Oh yeah. Gosh, Duct yeah. tape, scotch tape, bed sheets, towels. <laughs> it was, it was the gamut, but, um, you know, or you could go to Walgreens and spend three bucks to get an eye patch. Which is what Joel did. Yeah. <laughs> he had an eye patch and it looked good and he nailed the audition and he did like I think the whole scene, I think, for his audition. I'm like, who is this guy? Nice. And it was the first movie he's ever been. <laughs> and it's cool because you start to build your little ensemble, you know what I mean? So it's like you find a guy like that and then you go to make your next movie. I'm like, oh, let me think of a little role for him or whatever, you know? Yeah. Start building it out. Like you guys had worked together on shorts and the dude yeah. played charlie you know you start just yeah. building a team which is one of the cool things about indie filmmaking and then it's like as a group you can graduate to bigger and bigger productions the people who aren't working as well you kind of just don't call them back but you know <laughs> what i mean <laughs> quiet quiet quit <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That's, uh, on the board. that's on the wheel i think quiet quitting um one of the things i appreciated too as much as the acting was so naturalistic and if you get around to watching our film, it's going to be ironic that I'm saying this because ours is so fucking over the top. And I mean, it takes place in a single basement for the whole movie. So we had to do a lot of crazy shit to just feel dynamic. So it didn't feel stayed and everything. But uh, your directing style, at least in this film, very Clint Eastwood, very unobtrusive, mm. old school, put the camera in a good fucking spot, let the actors act. That's really what I love and prefer. And just like, even that scene where they start they go in for the extraction how you're up on the stairwell yeah and you're looking down i'm like at first oh do they get a crane they got a crane shot here or whatever oh no right. it reveals the stairs and then he comes up around to the camera that's just good old-fashioned good filmmaking you know put the camera <laughs> in a smart spot economical so yeah. props on that front <laughs> um, I, I gotta give greg a lot of credit for that shot because he he was breaking his back like holding holding the you know however much it weighs with the full gimbal i think like 40 pounds but holding it over the um the railing yeah this is a pretty high staircase it's like it's actually two stories so every time they and we did like nine takes so poor jesse and titania had to like stalk all the way through the field but then all the way up a two-story staircase right. to enter the attic but greg had to hold the the camera over over the railing um oh, to get the wide shot and then when you pull back and realize oh we're like on top of a, some kind of platform and now we're tracking them coming yeah. up the staircase that was a, that was a tough shot to get but that was one of the few that like greg and i storyboarded most of the movie but we as i said before he comes from a documentary background so he can we can completely change the shot list on the day of, and yeah. we won't get, we, we don't get tied to it. We just, it's our blueprint. It's like, like, here's the wish list. Here are the things that I, I know we would want to make the, the scene work. But as you probably know, like locations dictate how you're going to film. And, yeah. and lighting, like, everything, so many factors. It's like yeah, being in a fight, that. you got a game a plan, but you know, like Tyson said, as soon as you get in the mouth, the game plan goes out the window. Yeah. As soon as your boat keeps stalling and shit, everything. Yes. All right. Yeah. Now yeah, we're yeah. scrambling. 
Yeah. So um, yeah, props to Greg for, I mean, thank you for saying that about like, we, we did want to make an unobtrusive unobs- movie. Like we didn't want it to be my very favorite shit. Stylish. Just immerse me in it. You know? Yeah. Don't keep reminding me. I'm a director. Look, look, see me, which again, if you see our movie will be ironic, but it's a different kind <laughs> of animal. January yeah. 6th. How much did that play into this? Did that inspire you to create this or? No, I mean, well, that, the, the interesting thing is, you know, that, ha- that was 2021, right? Beginning of mm-hmm. 2021. So I wrote it, I wrote this script from like end of 2018 to beginning of 2020. And then I gave it to Kyle and then we worked on it a little bit. So, so we had the movie written and ready to film um, by you know, we started production November, 2020. So we filmed, we filmed the whole movie, all the Connecticut stuff in November, 2020. Um, And then we filmed just the Afghanistan scenes in March, 2021. You filmed Um, those out in Cali, I take it. Yep. Yeah. Those were just outside of LA in Silmar. Um, And that was a one day shoot. We had to get all those, we had to get those three Afghanistan flashbacks in, in one day which was a challenge for sure. Um, fun with blood work and all that kind of shit involved. Yeah, yeah. And, and I knew how impactful, especially the Noel's scene needed to be. So we did that first and we spent the most time on that. Um, I was actually really surprised we got all three scenes done <laughs> in, in one day because they were all also, they were all scripted for daylight. <laughs> so it's right. like, you, you don't have the luxury of like, oh, we have all day. No, you have like, you have like eight hours. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, I'd say what played more of a, a role in the writing and, and just what the militia's end goal was, um, was the, that, uh, the kidnapping of the, I think it was the Michigan governor at the time. Yeah, Whitmer, I think, right? Whitmer, yeah, yeah. That the the militia plan the plan, yeah. <laughs> because at the time that was considered pretty extreme. <laughs> right. You know, our the the sliding scale of of what's considered political violence and extreme has has um, been adjusted a bit. Yeah. Um, so, which is really interesting. I I don't know, you know, uh, mm. if if the rhetoric keeps up in terms of how divisive things have gotten um i'm curious you know it, it's sad to say but i wouldn't be surprised if there was uh a, an event some kind of political oh, violence yeah. that happened in the u.s i mean in this militia movement goes i mean it's been simmering for decades, yeah of course. If not a century i mean timothy mcveigh all that kind of shit you know yeah essentially tied into it but jesse switching gears are you now or have you ever been a functional alcoholic because you crush that shit? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, w- I will say that was maybe the least research I had to do. Uh, I, I, um, I don't know if I've ever a uh, functional alcoholic, maybe at times. Uh, I will say um, I think I was one of the people uh, early pandemic that was like, oh, this is great. I can drink every night. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, the being at home, and just hitting the bottle. And then finally, I think with like a lot of people had, had that moment where there's kind of had to check themselves and be like, all right, you can't, can't now just live like this. Yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, in terms of like the living on a boat and hitting the sauce, I think it was, uh, I had a, a maybe a recent bout with it. But uh, I would say, generally speaking, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say alcohol. Like I would say, yeah, I come from an Irish family. So um, there you go. we enjoy <laughs> our drinks. Um, but But yeah, it's always been. So he's been handled <laughs> with a mustache like that. You're tasting the beer all day anyway, whether exactly, you're drinking it exactly. or not. You might as well drink it. Get a little sand. It's the equivalent of like a, like a wine cork. I get it later on. <laughs> exactly. There are a lot of mannerisms that Jesse um, exuded that I, I don't know if it was just on a psychic level, but you know, I, I, I'd written kind of the, the alcoholism part of, of Justin's character based on like three friends that I, that I know who struggle with it. So they have like some pretty particular mannerisms and Jesse was only able to meet a couple of, of those guys, but um, he just nailed the, 
the aura of of what that is and what that looks like especially being so reclusive and especially having everyone having gone through the isolation of covid that was like a the script wasn't originally written to be set during covid you know because when right. i started writing it we, covid didn't exist um so but it really inspired the story in a way that i didn't realize it would like it just made everything more heightened and real. Yeah, I love that. There's only one mention of it, I think, by Noel's wife, right? She yeah, says something about COVID. But other than that, it's just like what it is. It's a fact of life. You got to wear a fucking mask. You know, you take it off to have a beer or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I, I kind of <laughs> that scene actually. So Noel's wife is played. Um, her character name is Michelle. She's played by Rose Murray Guess. And I met Rose in an acting class and. 2016 I think and that there are a couple people that really stood out in that class and um, she was one of them and so she was actually another person who I had in mind I didn't know for sure if I was going to cast her but when she read the part I was like okay done so um, you did you have scene, aspirations to be an actor before or um no no as a I director actually, you took it just to I did yeah I took it as yeah, yeah, I took it because I wanted to direct more. Um because yeah, I was editing for a while and I I was like, well, if I'm gonna um be communicating with actors, I kind of need to know <laughs> what the process as an editor, you see a lot of bad takes, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Right. Which is interesting yeah. too as a director to kind of yeah. like, what was it? What was the difference? What did they change to get the good take? You know what I mean? It's yeah. all instructive, is my point. Exactly. Like editing, acting, et cetera. It's all instructive to being a good director. Well, that yeah, it's 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 really fascinating because you know a lot of the times I'm watching dailies and you're seeing like the the heads and tails of the actual take, but for the most part, the camera cuts before you can actually hear the director mm -hmm. talking with the actor, and so that was missing that element of an education, really. So. Uh, I took that class and um, it helped me. I mean, I, I actually found out that I actually like liked acting, like with a strong piece of writing. I was like, oh, acting is, um, at least for scripted, it's just really relying on the, the script. Um, I, I mean, it's not obviously you have to do your own work and homework and stuff, but for me, it was, it was, uh, pretty eye-opening how how relevant strong writing needs to be or, or what actually you hear that jesse you're saying your amazing performance is owed writing. to his script right that's what he's doing yeah there. so what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> no no i actually just i it it made me a better writer basically is what i'm saying like taking an acting class made me a better writer and i'll probably do other acting classes just to immerse myself in that kind of world like i, I don't want to necessarily be an actor but i think you have to be pretty well-rounded um, yeah that's an interesting bit of advice for writers in general but especially writers who want to direct because a lot of writers too aren't super social they might be kind of timid which yeah. you can't be as a director so that could also right. help on that front taking an acting class you know just to open up a bit 100 percent hundred percent. I mean, yeah, I was struggling with public speaking for a while and the acting just, you know, threw that out the window. <laughs> as to the, as to the writing of, of, of Nightshade, one thing that I found really, Nightshade. really impressive was Northern Shade. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I like Nightshade. As night, as the word night came out of my mouth. Yeah. Hey, we've gotten northern exposure, which, which I, <laughs> let's go that way. It's Anytime actually someone says on, that you should expose yourself to. Them. Yeah, a couple of our award laurels have said northern exposure, like oh, different fun. film festivals. Northern lights, <laughs> or northern, northern lights. Northern lights. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Nightshade's better than all those. Carry I like on. nightshade. Yeah, it's now nightshade. <laughs> it is um, yeah. in Europe. But, but as Jack for the said writing it, of it, it's the fucking name of it. Sorry, go one on. One thing that I found really impressive was so many times when especially when the director also writes a film you've got so many you've got several 
very distinctive, different characters in your film. And they all sound differently. They don't, they all, the cadence of their, of their speech and their, just the writing for them is, is all completely different. Like you're writing in all these different voices. Mm. And one thing that's always annoyed me and Jay and I go back and forth about this guy, but I can't stand Quentin Tarantino because every character in every film talks exactly like Quentin Tarantino. Samuel L. Jackson is a black Quentin Tarantino and John Travolta is an Italian Quentin Tarantino. And this guy's the, and they all sound exactly the same. Your people all sounded individual and, and different. Mm -hmm. And that's, 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 I found the writing to be just outstanding. And thank you. Obviously the performances lent to, lent to it yeah. being believable from that, from that direction, but it doesn't, it can't get there without, without the writing first. That was definitely uh, one, a fear for sure. Was like you don't want every character to sound the same. Um, yeah, I, I think I was pretty aware of it. With I knew I wanted Billy to to constantly be trying to get something out of somebody. So I kind of knew what his voice was going to be, and I knew that Justin was just going to be a man of few words. So. I knew what, what his voice was going to be, but um, I didn't. Uh, I didn't have a game plan for. I, I remember when I was writing Austin, he started to sound too much like um, uh, Charlie, the younger brother, and so I did a pass on just those two characters, um, making sure that everything Charlie had was rooted in the. Um, you know, the fractured relationship that he had with Justin and then just making sure Austin's voice was um, really clear of any of that. Awesome. awesome. Just, really well done. Really well done. Thank you. I was going to say, also, uh, the first time I read this script and uh, with, with all of Chris's work, it's it's really cool to just read it and you, I always uh, hear the characters, you know, after the first sentence or two sentences in you're immediately, it's a character. It's, you don't hear like, it's not like Chris's voice doing the character. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they're, they're super well-defined. I also um, really appreciate about uh, Chris's scripts that they're, they're very much word perfect. Uh, just from, from projects we worked on before, he wrote it a particular way because he wants it said that way. Um, and so, you know, it's, I don't know if there's a, a better way to do it. I, I really prefer when it's word perfect because then especially as you're looking at the script, you know, everything is there for a purpose. And so, you know, if you don't quite get it, it's, there you go. You got to figure it out. And it's usually going to help you astronomically in figuring out the character to, to figure out the, you know, the phrase that you don't get, but um, yeah, it's all in there for a reason. And, and um, yeah, that's why you know I, that uh, he wants it said that way. Yeah. Being a writer director is such a different thing than just being a gun for hire director. Mm. And you get a lot more, some will be improvisational, but, you get that word perfect shit a lot more with an auteur who wrote in is directing it. And that's nice because there's nothing worse, right? Than a director who doesn't know what he wants. But when it is a Tarantino or whoever is very specific, nope, say it the way I fucking wrote it. They know exactly <laughs> what they want. Maybe once you get the take he wants, then you can play around a little bit. But to be sure. searching for it in the take, you know, that's kind of tough. We made our movie without a script, believe it or not. But uh, wow, that was, I mean, I scripted his dialogue, of course. Cause he goes on fucking 10 minute long hate speech rants, but uh, yeah, just structurally, we made it very with no crew, nothing. It was just the two of us in a basement for like years, <laughs> <laughs> literally. I mean, not years on end, but you know, a shoot day I, just years saw there. Movie. I just saw a movie uh, called masking threshold that, that kind of did the same thing. And I don't know if that's, it's a it's a product of you know being resourceful and having low budget but also like what i think covid mm -hmm. what's well, the single location of it Very i'm not going to try and make a movie without a script with 50 locations you know right that's just a logistic nightmare or whatever I mean, you can still have a shot list i guess and everything and do a curb your enthusiasm and improvise dialogue if you trust your actors but i think the way you guys did is right 
Did you have to pay a lot of money to get that Willie Dunn song at the end of it? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the only song. So every other song in the movie is, is by a musician friend. So, um, they let me use their music for a small licensing fee. Um, the Willie Dunn song, which I fell in love with the first time I heard it. And yeah, I was like, well, amazing. now I'm screwed because I love this song. And I want it in the movie. Um, uh, so our music supervisor, Zach uh, Sinek, who's been really helpful with this stuff. Cause I, you know, like, <laughs> I like writing, but I don't like, writing agreements and licensing contracts no. <laughs> um but yeah that's been a that's been a process because we had to negotiate first um you know getting the song for festivals yeah festival you right. a blanket right. festival license and you usually it lasts a year so um, if you get distribution are you going to owe more money you got to kick it out or what so as soon as as soon as we do sign for distribution yeah i'm um, that's one of the first calls i gotta make is to say the song yeah. goes and you got hey, so we got it. distribution which is awesome but now i know <laughs> our distribution deal is so money. bad we only have enough money to give willie dunn's estate cash right well the thing is is like, i think there's a misconception that when a movie gets distribution there's now like money no <laughs> <laughs> there's still no money like I still don't have any money to give people. So I'm going to be asking for, I'm going to be, I'm I mean, shit, you're to spending the money to go on the for, festival route. Yeah. You know? Right. Did you guys budget for the festival submissions or is that something you've just been doing out of pocket? So festival submissions were part of like my, yeah, like my, um, I had a budget for like after post cause I didn't mm -hmm. know what to call it. Cause I'd never done a feature before. Yeah, marketing so, really marketing. Sort of publicity yeah all those things because this is your first feature yeah yeah first feature um, okay <laughs> so it's quite, it quite a learning curve um just yeah budgetary um we i i did have a budget for film submissions and i went over it um i actually when we were making the movie you know everything was locked down it was november 2020 so uh my original plan was not to submit to any festivals. I was just going to try to go make the best movie I could and then get a distribution deal. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, end of 2021, right around the time when we're actually finishing the movie, all the festivals, most of them opened up again. And, and then I was like, well, it would be nice to submit here and then here and then here. And then all of a sudden, it's like for writers submitting to screenplay contests, it can become a black hole where you just get stuck in that. It's a total black hole. Your... And it's a costly black hole. Exactly. Um, With very, I mean, I, your odds are not great. You might as well buy a fucking scratch off the odds. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's submissions. And now so many festivals are such star fuckers, even like a slam band. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. something like Austin South by right. Southwest 20 years ago, it's like smaller films with populate their programming but yeah these days they they're all top heavy you know it's a very different ball game you know and you see it's like well okay you know the festival has to have a couple movies with some names in it because they need to draw people to yep. spend money on badges and tickets and all that stuff and which is great that's fine um, you know, you can have one or two centerpiece films, but like when it's like every title and you know that the movie already has distribution in place, exactly. it's, it's like, why are you giving them the platform? They don't need it. Right. And so it's, it's been pretty, it's been pretty interesting. It's like what um, Robert Redford created Sundance for versus what it is now. It's like, come on, yeah. like Spike Jones is screening shorts at Sundance and stuff. Like, what are we doing? He doesn't need yeah. that. Just put it on YouTube, man. You got millions of followers or whatever, right? Right. right. So do do a little bragging. What uh, what's been your festival success? What kind of? I'm I'm going to go ahead and assume you guys have you guys have taken home a bunch of stuff from festivals. I mean, we've we've gotten into seven festivals so far, and they run the spectrum from like pretty small, like inaugural first time festivals to. Um, I think the longest running festival we've gotten into is Woods Hole, Woods Hole and Mass. And that's a really good New England festival. Like I, I grew up knowing about that festival. So mm -hmm. that was kind of like our, it's like the New England version of, I don't know, 
tell you right, I guess. I don't yeah. know. It, it doesn't have the same prestige, but in, in New England, it's pretty well known. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've won, we've won awards at most of the festivals we've gotten into, which I think is really interesting because um, we haven't gotten into a lot. <laughs> but the ones we have gotten into, we've won awards at. Right. Just, we had you know, one festival that had the balls to screen Cactus Jack and we <laughs> swept everything in it so we can relate. <laughs> it's tough getting in there, but, and then it's like, I mean, like can't that be a precursor wouldn't it be nice if more festivals saw that and they're like oh we'll accept these guys they're obviously good you know but it's tough yeah yeah we won we won best screenplay at phoenix and that was that was our our premiere but also it was like our first award so it was um that felt good we felt like we had some good momentum and then then we had like a dry spell and we didn't get into any festivals that were playing in may and june and so, um, you know, with festivals, it's like you're at the mercy of whatever their notification date is. So you're constantly just waiting to know if you got in, mm-hmm. um, and which makes which makes adhering to premier regulations very, very tough because a lot of these festivals have clauses or stipulations that, you know, they'll only accept you if you're a certain premier. But yeah, you, don't, exactly. you don't know that. And so you can't it's. For a movie like ours, low budget and yours, you can't, you don't have the, the luxury of turning down a festival if, if they're asking you if you can play it. And so I'm like, yeah, we can play the festival. And then, oh, a month later, you find out you're ineligible. Yeah. They were going to accept your movie, but you, they found out that you already had a New England premiere. So they can't, you know, things like that. Well, Stop. these guys, all these people who didn't take you are going to regret not taking night. Right. Let me tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> You're damn right. Shady Acres. What's it called? Shady Acres. Shady, shady Acres. A so, hundred Shady Acres. Okay. Talking about that, the word perfect of it all, the script of it all, the auteur of it all. Do you have any inclinations to just direct something you didn't write? Or do you only plan to direct shit you write? Yeah, I would love to. I uh, mean, I have to send you a script. <laughs> Okay, sweet. Uh, yeah, I uh, I definitely want to. I the only thing I've ever directed that I didn't write was actually uh, Sven, which was the short film uh, Jesse, me, and Joe did um, before Northern Shade. And um, I had a I had fun taking that script that I didn't write and um, figuring out how to film it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was like in a way, it was pretty liberating. Um, and I could see how, I mean, just, just in terms of a production standpoint, if you're not so concerned, like Jesse said, and, and and you guys have said about Tarantino, but like, if you aren't so concerned with being word perfect then it's kind of uh, a little liberating. Yeah. Um, so I would, yeah, I would definitely. And you got someone to blame. Like, yeah, we did what we could with this script, but yeah, <laughs> people love throwing writers under the bus. Trust me. Yes. Well, it's like a three. It's it's going to go through another rewrite in the edit anyway. You know, it's like yeah, you make three movies: the one you write, the one you shoot, the one you cut, right? Yeah, yeah. So unless you're all three, um, the movie's going to get. What's your favorite part of the process? Is it editing? No, no. It used to be um it used to be i started i started jesse and i have had lots of conversations about editing because jesse just <laughs> i've been doing this shit for 12 years and jesse's cut a, a hulu tv series <laughs> really so you're an editor now editing's fun <laughs> as hell man to me that might be my favorite part of the process you know yeah yeah, yeah. it's yeah. a cool part uh I, one thing i want to say about chris's uh editing process for this is um is that uh he's the producer writer, director, editor. Right. So, uh, so many of the like producing decisions he made, um, uh, and things that he made happen then to see him have to edit stuff out that like, he just fought so hard to make happen. And there was, I think of the ambulance scene, but I'm sure there's other scenes where there's like locations that he just made happen and pulled off miracles. And then he's just like, ah, the, the editor in me knows I got to cut it. And I, I took my head off. Cause 
that's tough. <laughs> that's that old Stephen King yeah. kill your darlings thing. You got to be able to kill your yeah. darlings. And as an editor who wrote it and then shot it, that's got to be tough, but you got to do it. Yeah. There are some, yeah, there are some favors that I pulled and, and, and we got some really cool props or locations and it just turned out like doesn't fit mm-hmm. the story. I mean, the, I think honestly, the greatest piece of editing advice I ever got, and, and you can argue that, that, that other movies don't follow this, but um, so like my mentor is Mike McCusker, who's an editor, um, and I've worked with him for a decade now. Mm-hmm. And uh, towards like the middle of the editing process for Northern Shade, he, we were talking about some other movie um, that he was working on. And, and then I got to talking about how I have like these, this B story that isn't quite working in Northern Shade. And you actually don't even see, it. it's not there anymore. There was like a, a, a side plot that was happening. And, what was the side plot? Well, it was, it was, it was actually, it followed Frankie. It followed Frankie's character, the PI. And like it, she was figuring shit out about the militia at the same time Justin was. And the piece of advice I got was uh, a movie can only have one heartbeat. And so I had to really think about like what that heartbeat was and, and what I should focus on. And when I realized like the movie is about the brothers, then it was like, Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's not that supports that is going to stay. Yeah. Well, and it depends on what the movie is too. Cause I think it's something like sure. prisoners where you got Jake Gyllenhaal is doing this investigation. Meanwhile, Hugh right. Jackman's doing his thing, but the right. movie itself is a mystery. Yours isn't so much a mystery. It's like a character study. So yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's interesting too, because I did want it to start as a bit of a mystery, but then once you're in it, you're like, you're yeah, like first act mystery, et cetera, you know, by midpoint though, that shit should be dispensed with, you know? Yeah. So I think that was good advice. And I think it was smart to cut that probably. And another thing, nice lean hour and a half. Thank you. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> that's... Probably two hour and 20 minute long action movies. Like, what are we doing folks? What are we doing? No one wants to sit through that. No, that's a whole other screening you fit in per day at the theater. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Like, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Matt Reeves, and and I like pretty much everything he does. And I worked on War for the Planet of the Apes as a visual effects editor, and seeing his process with his editor, uh, Bill Hoy, um, was really helpful. But I will say. <laughs> There are are scenes in War for the Planet of the Apes that are too long. And there are definitely scenes in the Batman that I think they could have gotten rid of. But darlings to kill. Really amazing movies, yes. (laughs) For sure. What's next? Jesse, were there any uh were there any scenes that you were particularly really proud of that didn't make it? Oh um the editing process. No, I, I wouldn't say. I think uh, I don't think there's anything um, of mine that I think. Was there anything that got cut? I think I just in terms of um, I think some scenes got pared down. There was no, there was nothing that I saw. I'm like, how could you cut that part? <laughs> I delivered for you, Chris. How could you do that now? <laughs> um, no, nah, yeah, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say there's anything. That's that, how golf feels cut. about the drawing Muhammad scene we cut. Yeah, I'm yeah. still pissed. <laughs> oh wow, yeah, we had this great scene. Where I'm doing, I'm, I'm yelling at Muslims, and and I'm ranting about Muslims, and and I'm, and I'm drawing a picture of Muhammad. Uh, this was in reference to the uh, to the Denmark, the Danish cartoon. Yeah. yeah, and I'm saying now I'm drawing his baby touching hands, and I'm blah blah. It's, blah, 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 blah. it's over the top. And I hold it up, and it's blank. And then crumple it up and throw. It. And I loved that scene. And well, on his the, point being, you fuckers wanted to kill me just at the thought yeah. of drawing that you were wanting to kill me, and I didn't even do it, you know. And Jay didn't want his family to get murdered or some <laughs> bullshit like that, so it didn't make the movie. <laughs> so. uh, our producer, everybody's like, you know, cut that out, but we never had anything at like we never had anything that I cut. There was, there was a just in terms of, of, of um, you know, being shocking or extreme, like the, there were a couple um, other lines from Billy and other characters like that I cut that I didn't think we ended up needing 
that were that were racist and, and things like that. And I wanted to keep Billy a little more. I wanted him to be identifiable up to a certain time. Mm-hmm. And so I felt like if he if he was <laughs> he's, if the first thing he says is something racist, it's like, oh, he's the bad guy. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I was trying to, I was trying to kind of, um, take some of that stuff out in the edit. So, and there's the, the B storyline had to do with Frankie, but I did also take out, there's a scene of Justin picking up his coworker. Cause he's like, you're alone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is it cool if I start filming now? No, when do we get inside? Why are you here? I just thought it was really interesting, you know, that someone hasn't left their basement in six months, not even to use the bathroom. Is that true? Why would I want to go out there? I got everything I need right here. You know how many aliases I've used calling into radio shows? I've had it up to my goddamn gills with the systematic feminization of this country. Are we important way on that? Did your old damn show if you think you got that much to say? Yeah. You live in your mom's basement. What's so special about my loser son? You really do hate your own mother. She's a woman. Why wouldn't I? You know, there's some disconnect there, and, and if I could find it, what is hate? Where does it come from? Where does it go? Stay this guy's. It's like pure hate, man. I want to see something really fucking cool. himself Cactus Jack. We have watched as you have rocketed to infamy. And you wonder why these cornered animals lash out. And now, we have watched as you have called for literal blood. I know you're out there listening. It's buzzing in your ears, burrowing into your brain. Do it, Jack! You're gonna love this. I pulled that trigger off his head. Your VPN will not shield you. The dark net will not hide you. You and your kind are finished. You think I'm scared of you? Come and get me! Might I be your neighbor? Neighbor?